Um, so thanks everybody and welcome uh, all the folks who, who've joined us on uh, online. Um, and uh, thank you all for having your phone, and your microphone and, and camera off. And we'd ask if you could keep doing that as we as we go along. Uh, obviously not Gary, um, Mason or Erica, who we'd like to stay on. Um, so welcome to um, our third session for the afternoon on uh, looking at squirrel gliders. And, and this afternoon we're talking about habitat health and restoration. And thanks everybody for, for joining us for this session. My name's Stuart Cowell and I'm going to be facilitating this session this afternoon. Um, before we start, um, we like to make an acknowledgement of the country. So um, BioLinks Alliance uh, is proud to acknowledge um, the traditional owners of the places where we live and work. And we're all in different parts of the country and we acknowledge traditional owners in, in all those places. We recognise and respect the enduring relationship um, that traditional owners have with their lands and water. And we pay respects to elders past, present and future. Um, there's a bit of context for this afternoon's discussion. Um, we, we're looking at um, habitat health and restoration, so restoring and reconnecting remnant habitat in highly fragmented agricultural landscape, landscapes where squirrel gliders persist is a key action to ensuring their survival. Um, this session, we want to consider best practices for restoring landscapes for squirrel gliders. So today we've got three terrific uh, panelists, practitioners, researchers, policy makers, all um, have either been or are all of those at once. Um, so we've got Erica Marshall from the University of Melbourne, um, Mason Crane from the New South Wales Biodiversity Conservation Trust and Gary Howling from Great Eastern Ranges Connectivity Conservation Initiative. So thanks uh, to the three of you for coming. Um, the, the sessions are short, as those of you who've been to the others will know, we, we pull up on the hour and they're very focused. So we're aiming to share some ideas from this, these three panellists um, with the participants, and we want to make sure that we also have the opportunity to take questions from participants. We've got about 40 minutes. I've got five questions. Um, so, you know, those of you who are good at maths will we'll work out. We've got sort of six to eight minutes for each of those, depending on how much we all talk. Um, I'll lead out with a question to each of our panellists, give them a chance to provide some, some thoughts. We'll see what the other panellists think, and then um, are happy to take, uh, take questions. It's not, uh, it's an opportunity to comment, agree, contradict, expand, provide additional information. Um, so if you see a question come up in the chat and you've got the answer, please feel free to pop it in there. Because there's so many of us that we do want to use the chat for questions. So we're not taking video or audio questions. So um, if you're not familiar with Zoom, down the bottom of the screen, you should find a little chat balloon. Click on that and a little chat window will open please use that to, to put in questions or, or comments and we'll keep an eye on that. Uh, at the end, um, we'll be asking you to, to complete a, a short survey, which is really just a couple of questions about the topic that we'd like some guidance, direction, thoughts on. So um, Sasha's put the link into the chat already and we'll put the link in there and I'll remind you again um, at the end. Uh, but the BioLinks team is very keen as well as the conversation today um, to get your thoughts and observations in, in the survey. So with, with all that said, the housekeeping done, um, let's get into some, into some questions. And um, uh, Mason, the first, uh, I'm picking on you, is the, uh, to get us, uh, get us underway. So um, the question is this, do, do, do we know enough uh, about where squirrel gliders are in the landscapes to know where to best prioritise our conservation um, restoration efforts? Yeah, how can we identify those priority um, areas? I think you, you're on mute. Yeah, there we go. Excellent. Yes, sorry about that. No, all yeah, good. So I guess that's one of the big, the big issues with squirrel gliders. They're a pretty cryptic creature. And even if you go out doing spotlight surveys, they're not the easily, easiest thing to detect. 
And um, in places like the Southwest Slopes and parts of Victoria, they're often in uh, uh, environments where you may not think it's a great area for conservation, like things like paddock trees and small remnants on farms and uh, roadsides. So often people haven't looked there. So we probably don't have a full understanding, uh, a good enough understanding of the distribution of squirrel gliders across these landscapes, let alone um, their abundance and uh, the, some issues around genetics and and um, how isolated they are from other populations. So we probably don't know. It's improving all the time, and particularly with all the work that um, uh, land care groups and landowners have been doing, using putting nest boxes up and doing surveys. So it's getting there, but we still need a fair bit of work to do, and then we can probably have a more strategic approach to their conservation. Um, so Erica or Gary, do you have any thoughts about, about that? So knowing enough about where they are in the landscapes or, or you know, how we identify those priority areas, Erica? Oh. Gary, you go first. Gary, you're yeah, up. I was just gonna just observing actually that um, in in the last session we were joined by Mary Bonnet, um, who's been working on a Gladways project in the the Canangra Boyd to Wangla Link landscape. And one of the first questions that we really grappled with through that project was, firstly, whether there were gliders throughout the landscape, whereabouts in the landscape were they, but also how were they using the landscape. And so getting simply having the opportunity to be able to send ecologists out there to do some rapid reconnaissance survey to identify through spotlighting that yes, there are actually a variety of arboreal mammals in this landscape. These are some of the apparent hotspots where we found them fairly quickly, gave us a good insight into first of all, where we should be targeting a more structured survey effort. Um, but also it acted as a real catalyst for, for, for helping to engage the community, encouraging people to get involved and to start another dimension of the whole land restoration effort in which people on a local scale could feel like they were contributing to something that others in their broader landscape and broader region were contributing towards. Mm. And I'll just add to that, that understanding this kind of uh, distribution of where they are in the landscape is super important because we know that where you might put these conservation efforts has a really big impact on, um, on how the population or the species might persist in the landscape. So I think this is where we could draw on, we'll talk about this maybe a bit later, uh, but different modelling techniques and things that you can do to predict distributions more accurately, especially for data deficient species. Um, and understanding how interventions might actually affect things like dispersal and connectivity for these types of species can be really important. Um, so, well, let's 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 go to that that because it does seem like a natural sort of extension of that, Erica, and you know, pick up on you know, Mason's point about the, them being you know cryptic. You know how we you know how do, why would you use modelling in designing a conservation plans in a priority region, you know, given that? Yeah, I think, um, well, con strategic conservation planning is um, obviously being used more and more now, and uh, this can be really helpful for cryptic species. Uh, it can be kind of difficult because you don't know exactly where in the landscape they are. So people are using things like species distribution models, which take um, occurrence records, or species around the country and map them onto the, um, the environmental variables there. And so that might help clear up exactly where your species could potentially exist. Um, and I think the, the importance of that is identifying spaces in the landscape which are gonna be most helpful for the species um, and, and particularly where the highest suitability areas are. Um, yeah, conservation planning relies a lot on those types of modeling techniques uh, for directing where you might intervene in the landscape. Yeah. Um, so, um, Mason or, or Gary, any thoughts about, about that, about the use of modeling and um, in, in designing that, given, again, given what you've said about then you know, going out on the ground and so on? And Jerry's just um, yep. commented in the chat something really uh, important as well is that just because a, 
a glider isn't detected there doesn't mean it's not suitable um, habitat. We need to be considering places in the landscape where there might still be present, which is very true. Hmm. And I, Sorry, I was going to say the other thing is sometimes there might be dots on a map somewhere um, showing there's gliders there, but it might not be the best place to in, invest it. Just because there's a dot there doesn't mean there's better spots in that landscape to do a bit of work. Um, you know, like I guess sometimes national parks are some of the places that are more surveyed than some of the private land, but it could be sort of might have picked up one animal there in a fairly marginal habitat once. So I guess that's where model, I think that's where modeling can tie into um, like actual records as well to try mm -hmm. and identify. Well, we know they're in that area, but this is the model's telling us this is a really good spot down here. We should have a closer look at it. Mm. Yeah. And of course, the, getting the real world data then allows us to, to go and test and validate the models, the assumptions that are embedded within the spatial an analyses that are used. So there's a real opportunity for us. I mean, it was one of the big take homes that I had from this morning was the recognition that even over the last 30 years, we've, we've continued evolving our understanding about where various glider species are in the landscape. Mm -hmm. The spatial analysis tools can give us some fresh tracks towards identifying places to go to. And then we can continue to improve on and build on that capacity. But th the whole concept, as you know, Stu, um, that put maps and, and spatial analysis and planning together in the same conversation. And I'm on a happy planet here. So um, we, we've used a lot, of, um, a lot of spatial analytical techniques at different scales in the GR. And to me, having real world data understanding about how species are moving through the landscape, what habitat components they're actually using are really critical in helping us to do that spatial analysis and then translate that into a, a credible plan for whereabouts you should be focusing different activities moving forward. So why don't you keep pushing down that down that path, Gary, um, in terms of you know thinking about how we how we actually and the, the question's about scale up, but I think you know scale up here is not just about spatial scale, it's about sort of you know scaling up investment of effort and so on is a big jump from you know modeling to then ground truthing to then you know the investment that might be required in actually running a you know some you know landscape scale restoration project you know these are big steps um, so how do we you know scale up for you know for squirrel gliders um, you know how can we support mm. you know that and you know what you know, what lessons have we got from you know from other projects yeah sure um, there's a couple of ways that I could look at it. I, I, I guess probably one way I'd think about it is in terms of three scales or three ways of viewing the scaling up. Firstly, um, having a particular site where you can just physically scale up on the site um, by having greater resources or capacity available at a site to be able to, to build a bigger patch. Um, but then thinking in terms of district scale scaling up, um, it really relies very much on getting landholders working together and thinking across property boundaries, thinking across different land tenures um, and viewing the design of what you can do in linking up efforts and tenures across a landscape, viewing that through the eyes of, of a glider trying to get through the landscape. And then if you're looking at thinking about scaling across a species entire range or an entire landscape like the Great Eastern Ranges, Again, there's an even greater level of coordination, collaboration required between organizations and between the, the key leaders involved in local landscape initiatives mm -hmm. to get them together, viewing what they're doing in the context of a bigger plan and having at that bigger scale, a clearer understanding of what are the priority locations that we should be going to in the first instance. We're also then thinking about it not being a, a one-year plan, but a multi-year plan and, and identifying how do we actually step up our efforts and priorities over a period of time where not only where do we go but also when can we afford to go there um, and um, you know the um, one of my observations with these sorts of things is, is that relationship obviously between the, the modeling and the time taken to then roll those things out is, is there is there sort of, well, there's, there seemed to me to be risk associated with that sometimes as well in that you're sort of projecting where something might be in a, in a landscape that might not be friendly to it and, you know, you need to, you know, roll out a kind of landscape plan. How do we balance those things off of, you know, 
predicting where something might be and needing to sort of engage landholders and partners and so on over time, you know, flagging where we might go um, before we actually know we want to go there. How do we think well, about that? I guess um, one of the important things to consider when you're looking at where you do 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 investment is have a receptive sort of community that's keen to actually work work on the these animals like a bar and buttock examples a good one there's a community there that become aware that they had um squirrel gliders and um then they took a bit of ownership over the animal and now a lot of people are doing some pretty extraordinary things down there with some investment from the government as well to um secure that population so i think there's a few parts to it there's one understanding where they are um where is um sort of core habitat the best habitat um but also finding out making sure that i guess the communities are aware of what they've got but also working with communities that are ready to um get into it and that probably gives you a, a much more effective um uh conservation response i guess yeah yeah there we go. <laughs> Thanks for the shout out to my uh, glider earrings. <laughs> um, yeah, and there, there's a comment in the chat about um, connectivity and then also habitat modeling, um, ensuring this habitat that could be suitable or that we don't consider suitable doesn't fall off the radar. Um, and that's, that's totally true. I think the important thing here is that it needs to be backed up by actual occurrence records um, and data. Uh, ground truthing is obviously really important, but uh, back to what you were kind of saying before about uncertainty and um, there's always going to be some uncertainty associated with these things. So having good data is kind of key to that. Um, yeah. And then there was also a comment in the chat about canopy connectivity at local and landscape scale um, and mapping these things. And I think that that's also something that can come and handy, um, actually creating spatial maps of where the most connected patches are, telling you more about not just the habitat that's available for the squirrel gliders, but maybe where the habitat in general is might help uh, prevent some of those maybe patches that you don't think are so suitable from falling off their radar. Um, so, yeah. Sorry, you go. No, no, well, that, that sort of nicely leads me on to my question to um, you know, to make sure, so, so part of the question we're referring to from, from Bertram, which is that the you know, critical aspect is canopy gaps that can limit that, and therefore we need to start thinking about, um, you know, canopy connectivity, but also to some extent then restoration um, uh, you know, as part of that. So, you know, Mason, can you reflect on what we've learned about you know, restoration of squirrel glider habitat in fragmented um, agricultural landscapes in particular, you know, what, um, you know, have you got some key takeouts from, from yeah. your work on so the slopes, I, I, slopes? So I can probably reflect on, so I've, uh, for the last, for the previous 20 years, I've uh, I worked on uh, projects with uh, Dave Linemeyer's lab in the, uh, with, at the ANU. And I guess during this time, uh, I got to, you know, I guess anecdotally see a lot of um, uh, responses to to restoration work done uh, by squirrel gliders, and also um, just living in this community, I've also been out with a lot of land care groups and seen some of the successes that that they've had. So um, there's no doubt the revegetation work in this area and um, just natural regeneration has made this landscape. A lot more connected. Uh, there is an increase in woody veg in the southwest slopes, and it's probably the same in northeast Victoria. I think there's a few papers showing that. So it's in some places it is unlocking some habitat that's sort of been isolated away from uh, squirrel gliders over the years, and you know sites that um, the ANU are still continuing to monitor now that um, they are never had gliders in them until the planning's got to a certain age and then all of a sudden gliders turned up in some you know pretty um interesting places so there's no doubt that connection um with tree plantings is is helping and uh, you know tree plantings themselves aren't great habitat for gliders in them you know i think we're generally seeing that the tree plantings had to be around 30 years old before the gliders were sort of starting to forage forage in them 
but as a as a way to connect up other habitat patches, they probably act a bit a, a bit quicker, you know, as soon as they're big enough that they can move around in. But um, one of the other interesting things that I noticed in the PhD that I did was um, it wasn't just your um, like it's it wasn't just local native species that were coming very useful for um, gliders, like places where they put spotted gums in, which aren't endemic to the southwest slopes. Um, Things like blue gum and viminalis, which don't like the drought conditions here and often die after 10 years. But in their early stages, that ribbon bark that they provide um, was really sought after habitat. So there is a bit of a recipe you could put into your native vegetation plantings um, where you mostly put endemic species in, but you might put a few sort of glider lollies in there for them that they'll come into and use them a bit earlier. So, I, th I think that's one of the uh, interesting things I've seen. We've seen uh, nest boxes can can be effective in some places, but often people think just putting nest boxes up is a good thing in general, but you need to really have it fairly targeted. Um, and when it is targeted uh, uh, in, a, in the right way, gliders will use their boxes and, and will move in pretty quick if they're in the area. So that reminded me of a place up near Kaukau where um, uh, they were targeting areas that were close to um, stock routes, so it had good connectivity. But the sites were dominated by yellow box, which is prime habitat for gliders in this area. But the trees were big, but didn't have hollows. And uh, as soon as they put nest boxes in, in a couple of weeks, gliders come in there pretty quick. Um, so I've got a got a question which you, you might be able to address or, or otherwise Gary or Eric, is there, are there successful examples of introduction of squirrel, of, um, squirrel gliders into unoccupied suitable habitat? So where they have, it's suitable, but hasn't been occupied and squirrel gliders have actually moved in. Do, do you know of any examples of that? I think that's probably one for Gary. <laughs> I don't know, I, yeah. I probably- Sorry, I lost it. I lost the mute button. Um, look, certainly we've heard anecdotally about some um, places where they've been putting in nest boxes. And, and one of the strategies that we've used in the Central West is, for example, with where there's a little population of, of feather tails um, and a patch of habitat next to it that seemed like it was a suitable habitat, but wasn't being occupied at the time. I gather that um, there was a, a history of, um, of selective um, thinning and logging um, back in the day and um, probably degrading the, the habitat to an extent or removing the nest hollow. So we recently actually started to put, um, put nest boxes into that location and with a strategy to actually test that if you put them, locate them closer to where you have the known population, can you actually then draw them out into the, the, um, the other habitat where they're not currently, currently uh, existing? So that's actually a work in progress and and as I said, Mason was saying the example that he gave about um, occupancy increasing in, in places where um, putting in, um, in nest boxes and within a fairly short period of time, starting to see that occupancy in locations where we haven't seen them previously. Yeah, and I guess that's a, that's a natural thing in even intact landscapes. There'll be areas that will wink out of popul like the population or wink out due to a fire or drought or owls or something like that and things will move back in again and yeah. I guess uh, it's, it doesn't help when things aren't connected very well because once they wink out they can't get back but uh, the re like I was saying before we have seen places where they have been connected by revegetation have uh, been recolonized once again. Yep um, so again another another question from from the from the chat I mean we so we're talking about if you'll pardon the sort of broad characterization but um, you know modeling where we might understand where where gliders might be um, you know restoration to you know improve uh, habitat uh, planning you know to to understand how we might roll out a program and those three things fit together you know, very importantly and necessarily um, as part of an integrated approach. Um, there's a there's a, the, a question here um, from um, Desma, which is, you know, they've got squirrel gliders, 
So, you know, modelling tick, you know, they want to improve the habitat, um, uh, but want to know how to get the local council on board because that habitat where they are is, is council land. So it feels to me like it's a sort of a planning stakeholder type question, but, you know, Desmond's just asking, like, so how do we, how do, we do that? How do we, how do we go down that path of, you know, working with people who've got the habitat um, to um, you know, get them to support this? Um, I'm, I'm happy to have a swing at that. That's, a, that's an issue that we encounter on a really regular basis up and down the Great Eastern Ranges. And to be honest, it, to some extent, it's part of the reason that we adopted in the, right from the outset a, a, a regional collaboration model of bringing the various stakeholders who, who have an interest in a landscape and in getting particular ecological or, or biodiversity outcomes um, in that landscape, um, they've got an interest in, in seeing those outcomes achieved, um, bringing them together so that each can recognize, uh, is able to be get a better understanding of the groundswell of support for a particular initiative or course of direction, both within the lo local community, but within organ other organizations that, that, are, that are working alongside them. That to some extent provides a degree of peer pressure um, that's an optimistic message and we've seen a lot of examples where organisations that haven't previously been involved um, either in conservation works or the types of projects that we're talking about or even focusing attention into sensible locations might be doing plenty of stuff but just doing it in daft locations um, we've seen a, a significant turnaround in behaviour through a number of those conversations that said there are always going to be circumstances where particularly dealing with with certain organizations, a lot of it really comes down to down to the personalities involved. And sometimes people can just be a little bit pig headed and, um, and a little bit slow to buy into the overall outcome. Nice. Yeah, and I guess the um, there was a on the discussion we that, that I was on this this morning with Rodney Vander, he, he gave a good example where he went out with a um, a, a mob of developers that were developing a new suburb or housing estate, and he went out with the um, yeah with with, with the, those people and and actually showed showed them some of these gliders and caught them in the trap. And he said um, it really changed the way they thought about it. So I guess the more uh, ways you can try and bring the animal to people, whether or not it's um, try and um, capture some pictures to send into the local paper to show what they've actually got in that area or um, try and organise spotlighting nights and that sort of thing. That's sort of a good way to get people in touch with their, um, you know, I guess, their inner conservationist. And um, and then they might, um, you know, look uh, enjoy it. And I think that's always the best way. I think local government's a hard one though because they've got a lot of other competing values and very often under under resourced but um i think if the community value it then the generally the local government then will start taking it on yeah okay you have any thoughts about uh, this one uh yeah it's a bit outside my um my expertise but i think like you say if you can engage people with the species it's usually so much more effective um that's the benefit of squirrel eyes being cute and fluffy, I guess, is that people tend to engage really well with those species. Um, but I, yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. Um, while, while we're with you, I mean, I, I imagine all, all of you particularly, but um, you know, Gary and, and Mason would, and certainly I have, and I'm sure a number of people on the on the session have got quite a bit of experience with you know modeling tools and so on, but sometimes they feel a bit out of reach and you know, how do we use them? So just, you know, what what tools are available and how readily are they applied? If we're saying that's a key part of our, you know, restoration strategies, understanding where we might put our efforts in the landscape and try to identify that, you know, how, you know, how readily are modelling tools applied and what sort of input and data is needed to actually drive them so that people yeah. can use them? Yeah, so I, I mean, I think the, the good thing about this is that these are emerging all of the time um, and it's just an ever expanding field. Um, it does make, I guess, a bit harder for people to stay on top of what modeling techniques might be most effective um, and what might be most useful. And I think a key part of this is the 
the data that's needed to run some of these and the expertise that you might need to, to build models. So for example, I've been doing population models for squirrel garters, um, looking at the impacts of offsets on their long-term population viability. And I, it took me, I guess, two years of my PhD to um, really figure those, <laughs> figure those out. But I think those are improving all the time. So I, whether or not they're readily used, I wouldn't really say that in my field, at least in offsetting that they're used frequently, but I think that they could be really helpful if you have the right data to do it. Um, I think what, the key, sorry. What stops their use? Why, why aren't they used more? Um, I think particularly in offsetting, it's usually a time frame thing and how off, like how quickly developments need to be implemented or um, an offset needs to be put in, but also it can be, I guess, quite data intensive or population viability analysis, for example, is uh, probably a bit more complicated than you'd want for an assessment on development impacts because um, you need data on fecundity and survival and dispersal. And then there's often associated spatial data that you need. But I think modeling tools are getting better if, all the time. So new ways of modeling populations are more user-friendly, um, easy to learn, less data intensive. Uh, but I think that's probably been the limiting factor for their use in my field, at least. I don't know if anybody else could comment on that. Also, it's not required that these kind of models are used. So you don't have to, they don't do it. Yeah. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to comment on that, but. Gary or Mason? You, you um, well, I guess in your... no. We don't. I haven't. Uh, I haven't really used a lot of models in 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 uh, during my career. But um, that I, I, one thing I do know: that, look, models are as good as the data that goes in them too. Sometimes, um, yeah. So so making sure we keep updating models. But um, I think on a local scale, there's probably often some simple rules that you can use to um, help guide restoration work as well, like um, mm -hmm. uh, Ray Tom Thomas or Thompson down in uh, Victoria, down there with his squirrel glider and uh, uh, nest box project down there, like they worked out some of the key um, things that squirrel gliders needed down there and made a little tiny short little spreadsheet of where to put nest boxes. And uh, generally they worked very well. So there's, it depends when you talk about models, like at what scale you want to sort of implement it and uh and to what sort of rigor you want but sometimes that you know as a local land care group there's some basic and you know you've got squirrel gliders in the area there's some basic features that they like um, and you can sort of just apply that to your revegetation strategies as well yeah mm -hmm. and i think that that touches on a really important point as well that um with, with models being a being a tool that's a complement that sits alongside local knowledge i remember i had a I had an experience about um, eight, nine years ago where we, we tried the two techniques in parallel. We, on the one hand, we, we spent $30,000 on commissioning a U-Butte spatial model for a landscape. We did all of the landscape values analysis for a variety of movement guilds um, and the like. Um, we also ran alongside that a couple of um, full day workshops with key stakeholders. And it was just simply a case of getting them to download their knowledge, big maps, big circles on maps, sticky notes, you name it. It was a post-it fest. And um, when we got the results back from the spatial analysis and we sat the two alongside each other, it was pretty amazing that once you digitized the hand-drawn version and posted it over the spatial model, it was a lot cruder, obviously, but it really validated and told us a lot of what the spatial modeling was telling us. At the time, I thought myself, oh, bugger, I've just wasted 30 grand. But actually, then we, we were actually able to use those analyses to give ourselves some, some metrics that we could then measure over time um, and that we ultimately used in um, five years down the track in um, validating the outcomes from the project overall. It gave us something by way of quantification of biodiversity change. Yeah, I think um, those two kind of interacting things input like getting experts in on um, validating models and stuff is so important because often these models can just be uh, used once and then relied on for <laughs> a long time, which, you know, I think if you've got good data and everything behind it, 
like you say, you can get the same outcome from, from understanding what people are doing on the ground and what they know. It's a poorly utilized resource, I think. Yeah, definitely. Part of the value, I imagine, Gary, is having both those data sets, you know, mm -hmm. because, you, because you are each is validating the other. So it gives you a high degree of confidence, um, I would expect. Um, so a general question to all three of you, and I will come around to all, all three. So, you know, with this broader question, sort of habitat health and, and restoration, you, you know, what, you know, what is, um, you know, the sort of most critical issue for us over the next 10 years in relation to squirrel glider habitat and habitat restoration that you, that you see from each of your particular perspectives? Um, let's start, Gary. Um, well, I'll, I'll look at it through my connectivity lens. Yeah. Um, the continued erosion of, of connectivity at all spatial scales. Um, and that's not just habitat connectivity, but also loss of, loss of connectivity between um, the, the, the actions that people are undertaking um, as, a con as, a sector, as a sector. I've often made the observation that the conservation community can tend to be a little bit insular. Everybody focused on their own particular patch, um, which is why Great Eastern Ranges and programs like Guideways are very much about getting organizations together in priority areas, getting them understanding what each other is doing, then looking together at the landscape and working out what are the things that are actually er eroding or getting in the way of our enhancing the connectedness of habitat for the species that we're interested in managing within this landscape then to let together identifying the priorities, owning the solutions collectively and moving forward together. And, and just to, so that sounds like a, yeah, that's a, that's a, a big answer. Where does a, where does a local group fit into that, into that answer? The, the same principle at the local scale, whether you're an individual landholder looking across the fence at what your neighbor is doing, but also talking to your neighbor about what, what it is that they're doing and what you're wanting to achieve. Then within a local land care context, being able to take a look across multiple properties and think about it at that local scale. But also as well, ultimately, um, the actions that are undertaken ultimately are taken by individuals on the ground um, who are out there in the paddock doing the work themselves. Yep. Thanks. Um, Erica, what, what, what do you say? Uh, um. Well, having spent the last three years working on offsets uh, and offsets for squirrel gliders, I think I'd probably have to back up Gary's point about uh, dealing with losses of habitat in between patches and um, this issue of connectivity. I think I see that as being a big priority for uh, restoration in future is make, making sure we restore areas that connect habitat up um, and allow populations to flourish more easily. Uh, I think having not really been in the man management side of things, I wouldn't really know what to say about managing um, these kind of restoration health problems, but I think collaboration is really going to be a key because so many th people are doing different things at different scales um, and, you know, experts can be helping out with these problems as well. So I think sharing data and, and collaborating as widely as possible might help kind of connect some of those gaps. Um, and when do you see the big habitat loss? You know, is that, that peri-urban space? Um, oh, look, I think probably. Um, yeah, I think greater emphasis obviously needs to be put on avoiding impacts where possible. Most of my research has found that if you took even minor steps to avoid impacts uh, on habitat, you would actually end up with some pretty good results for long-term persistence. Yep. Um, but unfortunately, I don't think the legislation supports avoidance enough. Um, I think that's kind of key for future success. Legislation. Okay. That's not a great answer, but sorry, better legislation. <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand. Uh, and and Mason, where, from your perspective, you know, where do you where do you see the the big challenge here? I think one of the things is is um, just getting, I guess, land care groups, landowners, um, and I guess uh, 
different uh, and different organisations to recognise opportunities when they've got opportunities in their place. You know, like uh, scattered paddock trees. If you've got uh, the, if you've got them in your uh, in your area, close to um, in squirrel glider habitat, they give you really good opportunity to do revegetation around them you know don't because a lot of people are doing reveg on their farms anyway for reasons about productivity for stock shelter and stuff like that um if people realized you know if i include move me fence that way a little bit more and get them a couple of paddock trees in it all of a sudden i've given myself some oh, i guess a you know 200 300 year head start and i've got an instant screw glider habitat uh because now them trees are connected up and um or if they've got a big yellow box patch on their place, uh, and yellow box is notorious for taking a long time to get hollows in it, so they can be a 100-year-old yellow box, great habitat for gliders, but if there's nowhere for them to uh, den, that's not going to get used as much. So identifying the right areas to put nest boxes. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the big challenge is, is making sure we um, uh, provide the assistance to these type of groups and landowners so they can uh, direct their, their conservation effort in the right way because I think there is a lot of will out there to do good things for the environment and um, it just needs to be directed better to maximize the outcome yep I think um, and we're at um, we're at the top of the hour um, it's a Good question uh, for uh, Bertram, or an observation, really, which I think you've all supported uh, from what I've heard, which is, uh, Bertram says, depending on the landscape, should we be focusing on the habitat that might have the better long-term outlook? And to me, the, the three of you have essentially answered that with a, with a yes, um, but also, and I think sometimes it's given, it is treated, it's far too much of a trite response, but you've also emphasised the need for you know, collaboration and coordination uh, in this space to be able to work at the scale that's required. So uh, in, in my mind, uh, there are a couple of key things that have, that have come out um, from you all. So um, I'd like to thank the three of you, Gary, uh, Mason, Erica, for your time. Thanks for spending time yeah, with us no all this afternoon and for, no worries, your, for your knowledge. Um, everybody on the on the line um, again. Remember, there's the link there. Um, just uh, seeking your additional thoughts. Um, we've got the chat, obviously, which we'll capture. Uh, but your additional thoughts about this question of um, uh, you know habitat um, health and, and restoration, um, and you know these ideas are sort of going into to help the Biolinks folks uh, really think about what they do in this space. So. Thank you all very much for your time this afternoon.